Good morning and <clears throat> welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ here in Ocala, Florida, the heart of Central Florida. We welcome you to our online worship services conducted during the COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic has taken a toll on the world, I think. It certainly has taken a toll on our church, our sense of connectedness, I think, to some degree. But on the other hand, I think it, it, it has strengthened us. And remember that when we get to the sermon today. A reminder, too, that we are an open and affirming church, meaning that no matter who you are, no matter where you are in life, on life's journey, you are welcome here among us into our love, our fellowship, our leadership, into our responsibilities to each other and to the world. Today's scripture reading is from John's Gospel, highly metaphoric language, and it takes a bit of work to discern what's going on with this. Well, I'll read it. I'll read it. 15th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Jesus is speaking. He says, I am the true vine, and God is the vine grower. God removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, God prunes in order so that it can make more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. I think you figured out here that the vine is the church. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, he repeats. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me you can't do anything. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. God is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Friends, listen. God is still speaking. We are still listening. Some of you will remember that several years ago, I cleared the fence line between our church and our neighbor's back pasture, back there in the backyard behind the utility shed next to the property line. Lots of weeds and brush and junk and bushes and ugly tree saplings, home to at least one copperhead snake, as I discovered. So. I mowed them down with our church bush hog, every last one of them, low as I could. And wherever I could, I lowered the bush, ho the bush hog deck down real low and chopped out the roots. I did all this and went to great lengths for a specific reason. I wanted to do a mitzvah for our neighbors by making our shared fence rope look good. How did Robert Frost put it in his poem, Mending Walls? Good neighbors, no, I got it backwards. Good fences make good neighbors. That's what I was after. And I was intent on taking care of the fence and building up good relations via my mitzvah of cutting down anything taller than a blade of grass. In addition to mowing down everything in sight, 
I fed carrots to our neighbor's thoroughbred horse and rubbed the horse's nose. We became acquainted. I remember, I remember thinking at the time that it was a perfect moment for an, an Ocala Chamber of Commerce photo op. That's what I thought at the time. That's what I thought. The next day, the next day our neighbors across the back fence showed up at the church office and announced that some blamed fool had chopped down over 30 of their silverthorn bushes next to their fence. Their bushes, their fence, not our bushes, not our fence, their bushes, their fence. They demanded an explanation, and I confess that I was, in fact, the blamed fool, that I was trying to be a good neighbor by doing a mitzvah, and then I had to explain what a mitzvah was, but that I would do whatever I could to save the lives of the few remaining silver thorn bushes, and that I would replace the ones that I had murdered. They were very gracious, I must share that with you, in response to my confession and promise to make repairs, although they weren't smiling a whole lot. Which made me wary when Earl Livering came by my house and told me that I needed to prune my crepe myrtles or I'd be in big trouble. So I did. I pruned them. But I couldn't help remember I couldn't help remember the silver thorn bush incident affair. The silver thorn say that twice, silver thorn bush affair. So I asked one of our members, I, I think it was Eleanor Hoffman, whether or not I should have pruned the crepe myrtles and Eleanor said that crepe myrtle should never be pruned and that everything, if I had done it, everything would be ruined, ruined. Too late, Eleanor. I'd already murdered the crepe myrtles, but you know what? Those crepe myrtles, they grew back just fine. And they look great with their new foliage that's rounded and shaped instead of ugly and pointy, and all apologies to Eleanor, they looked better than ever. Yep. Unlike the silverthorn bushes, maybe that's what worried Eleanor. Maybe she thought my idea of pruning is actually murder. I can certainly understand why she might think that, but I learned a valuable lesson through this whole thing. Horticulturally speaking, a vast difference exists between pruning and murder. What's, what's the purpose of pruning a plant? Several. Possibly to make a plant look more attractive, to make it take a particular shape, to take cuttings in order to make other new plants, to create a new hybrid or something like that, to force the plant to flower, that works sometimes, to keep the plant from taking over other plants, and sometimes, sometimes to keep the plant from destroying itself. And if you figured out by now that none of this has to do with horticulture and plants, you'd be correct. The main focus of the parable from today's scripture passage is that in order for us to be healthy, adult human beings, sometimes we need pruning. The focus of the parable is not on how we look in the sense of body image, but what we need to do in order to promulgate our finest gifts, 
to live in harmony with others and to be in right relationship with God. Take a careful look at today's scripture passage. The ultimate objective of pruning isn't to destroy, but to enhance. That tossing in the fire thing is the option of very last resort. So don't get stuck on that, because here's the thing. God, love, love to be specific, has expectations, precise expectations for all of us. And whoever either won't or can't contribute to serve those expectations needs to be pruned. But again, I must stress, the emphasis isn't on destroying those parts that don't contribute, but pruning, pruning them in such a way that they can contribute. Or, if you take a look at the silver thorn bush affair, and the crepe myrtle affair, the objective is to prune the plant, not chop it out by the roots, not destroy it. And I submit that the best person to prune a person is the person him or her self. I also submit that self-pruning however it gets done, involves a certain amount of physical and or emotional discomfort. And if it doesn't, the pruning is superficial. Years ago at one of our Florida conference, annual conferences, I was talking with one of my longtime colleagues about, you know, life in general, and right out of the blue, he he shifted tangentially, just took off in another direction and made the following statement. Hal, I am absolutely convinced that every teenager needs to endure a rite of passage that involves pain and that this rite of passage must leave a permanent mark. The world wouldn't be as messed up as it is if there were some mandated rite of passage involving crisis, pain, a permanent mark, and most of all, parents to butt out and let their children suffer a little. I was taken aback by this, but I certainly have strong opinions on the matter. I responded that such a thing would never, never happen these days with every imaginable excuse by overprotective parents who won't let their children ride a bicycle without a suit of armor or get in a dirt clod fight. And of course, of course, not to mention child protection laws and our society's concerted effort to protect children from the world in general, not to engage it, but to protect them from it. I shared that several of my medical professional friends advise parents to let their children play in mud. It builds up their immune system. The only way I personally am going to die is by blunt force trauma of some sort. I will never die from a disease. No, no, no. I've eaten enough mud. Anyway, my, my colleague wasn't interested with my perspective on mud and responded, Hal, do you know what the dirtiest word in the English language is? Well, I must say that I've heard one or two dirty words in my time. But since he was on a roll, I inquired about the dirtiest word in the English language. And he said, Hal, the dirtiest word in the English language is, drum roll, discipline. And then everything became clear because I knew exactly what he meant. What my colleague was getting at is this. 
The objective of a rite of passage for teenagers, children, is not pain, and it is not scar tissue or leaving a mark. It is not fear. It is not to invoke loss. The purpose of a rite of passage is discipline, the will to transcend life's assorted crucibles. But you want to know what discipline really is at its most base level? I'll tell you. Discipline is self-pruning. And the objective of self-pruning is most certainly not pain. Do you think for one second that the purpose of pruning my crepe myrtles is to cause them physical pain, to make them suffer? Of course not. That's silly. It's to make them grow better. And as for self-pruning, the objective isn't pain, but is to make oneself a more wholesome, mature, better person. Come on. Furthermore, the objective of calling people to prune themselves isn't to bully them. It isn't to jack people around just to show who's the biggest dog in the junkyard. The objective of self-pruning is refining one's self, becoming more perfect more divine, more holy. To discipline oneself within the love of Jesus Christ could not, by definition, include coercion, torture, or self-mutilation. But there's no question that it will always include some sort of discomfort. Because to prune oneself within the love of God means pruning those parts of ourselves that aren't yet loving, as loving as they could be, which is a very tall order. Don't think so? Oh, my gracious, how easy it is to rationalize and excuse those parts of ourselves that we judge and anyone else to fall far short of their best, at least, which is good camouflage for our own shortcomings. One thing's for sure, when it comes to pruning one's self, or one's plants, you can count on everybody else being a critic. One other thing is for sure, too. It's the radical exception to need to light the fire. The ordinary course for mature men and women is to live and learn, take a few lumps now and then, forgive yourself, Show a little patience and lighten up on others who are working on shaping up their own self-pruning. Which, of course, is the entire purpose that God has for us in the first place. In being human. In being the best we possibly can be we approach divinity. Think about that one. Jesus walked this lonesome valley he had to walk it by himself for nobody else could walk 
it for him He had to walk it by himself Oh, we must walk this lonesome valley We have to walk it by ourselves For nobody else can walk it for us We have to walk it by ourselves Now we must go and face our trials we have to face them by ourselves For nobody else can face them for us We have to face them by ourselves gathered his followers together around the table and they ate the Passover meal as a family, not related by blood, but by faith. Each person there had hopes and dreams, disappointments and fears. Sometimes they all got along and sometimes they didn't, but they were bound together by their love and belief in Jesus. Today we are the family Jesus has gathered together for this meal. We are the people who bring all that we are and all that we hope to be to the table. We as brothers and sisters by faith, the body of Christ. We have all received Jesus' invitation to share the bread and cup. So come eat and know that we have found the common home and family in Jesus. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we come to this table bringing all parts of ourselves, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We confess that we are not perfect. We carry within us both goodness and shame compassion and contempt, holiness and idolatry. We lay the worst part of ourselves at your feet and ask for forgiveness. Fashion for us an open and loving heart, an unbiased mind and a willing spirit. Widen our circle to include all your people, even those we don't like we do not understand, or we do not agree with. Transform our stubbornness, unclench our fists, and give us the eyes and heart of Jesus. Amen. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking that our eyes may be opened and that we might recognize the risen Christ in our midst, indeed in one another. Come, Holy Spirit, come. As we come again to this table, we remember the story that Jesus' friends told. It was a night of celebration and also betrayal when Jesus took bread left over on the table, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, When you eat this bread and remember me, you become one in my body. Take and eat.
And on the same night, and in much the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, My very life blood will be poured out for you. But when you drink this cup and remember me, I will be with you. Take and drink. We are grateful for this food to our body and spirit, reminding us of your deep love for us and your desire that we live in harmony and peace with our neighbors. Show us the way as your people to make our church a home for those who need love, attention, nurturing, and a sense of belonging. Break open our hearts and extinguish any resistance we might have, so all will truly be welcome as one of our family. Encircle this family as well as all the families of our community, nation, and world, so that every person might feel safe and cared for. Amen.